When I saw that Robert Pattinson and Colin Farrell are going to be in the new Batman movie, it reminded me of this weird thing the two actors have in common. Both of them played vampires at some point in their careers. In the late 2000s, early 20 teens, Hollywood was going through a bit of a vampire phase after Twilight stole the hearts of teen girls along with their moms everywhere. I was one of the Twilight haters where I just rolled my eyes when a friend told me they threw their book across the room when they saw that Edward dumped Bella in New Moon. I didn't care for all the vampire romance movies and TV shows that were being released at the time because I was more into the supernatural aspects of the genre. Vampires are scary. They're undead monsters that feed off the blood of the living to survive, which is actually pretty metal. Don't give me that romance and existential crisis crap. I want a vampire that just kills people with no remorse. Oh, thank God you're in. Oh you're God. in. Fright Night is the 2011 remake of the 1985 film with the same name. I haven't seen the original movie, but from what I've read, this movie is more of a reimagining than a remake, but they share the same premise. I came across this movie when it was playing on one of the movie channels on TV. This was the start of my Colin Farrell obsession, where I would look at movie clips on YouTube with his natural Irish accent, and I'd read gossip articles on him. I was going through the same phase as people did for Robert Pattinson. I haven't seen this movie since Vampire Mania died down after the last Twilight movie, so let's take a look and see if it's as good as my teen self thought it was. Before I start drooling over Vampire Colin Farrell, I just want to give a moment of silence for Anton Yelchin, the lead actor playing Charlie in the movie. This is Fright Night. The movie begins in a quiet suburb in Las Vegas, and a TV gives us some completely not forced exposition. In the northern Las Vegas suburb of Hillcrest Parks today, a woman leaving a grocery store says a man came up to her and tried to bite her. He was scared off by the security guard. A kid tries to defend himself from an unseen monster, but the monster finds him. Then we get the proper opening. We meet Charlie, who's perving on his neighbor Doris. Charlie's mom is being a nosy neighbor complaining about the new neighbor having a dumpster on their driveway. He's not digging a pool, so where did all this concrete come from? They're probably just remodeling. My parents remodeled their house and none of the neighbors cared. It's perfectly normal. You have to rent out a dumpster, so he's not going to have it on there forever. Deal with it. Charlie goes to school with his girlfriend Amy, and some of his classmates haven't been showing up to school recently, including his former friend Adam. His other former friend Ed thinks that something is wrong, but Charlie thinks all the missing people are just ditching school. Ed asks Charlie to go with him to Adam's house to check if he's okay, but Charlie ignores him to hang out with his new friends. I don't think you understand what I'm telling you. Um, Adam is gone. Do, do you to do this here? Okay, former friend or not, if someone comes up to me telling me that they haven't seen or heard from someone and is concerned for their safety, I'd go and help them look for him. I don't care how popular you think you are. Someone you were once friends with might be missing. You know where they live, just go to the house and check on them. Charlie lies to Ed and says he'll go with him after school, but he instead hangs out with Amy and meets the new neighbor helping Charlie's mom fix something in the yard. Jerry introduces himself to Charlie and Amy, and Amy seems to think he's hot. Hi, I'm Amy. Yeah, same here, Amy. He tells them that he works as a construction worker at the Las Vegas Strip, and he's been trying to fix the foundation in his basement. Like I said, he's just fixing up the house. That's totally normal, Mom. Charlie gets a text from Ed saying he'll out Charlie for being a nerd if he doesn't go and help him find Adam, so he blows off Amy and his mom and heads over there. He meets Ed at Adam's house and nobody's home. Ed crawls in through the doggy door, unlocks the door, and he and Charlie take a look around. Ed tells Charlie that Jerry is a vampire, and Charlie is understandably skeptical. That is a terrible vampire name, Jerry. What did you expect his name to be? He's a vampire in hiding. He's not going to use a weird name. The vampire council probably sent him a memo. From now on, no more of this clever name bullshit. When a vampire is pretending to be a human, they can just call themselves Alan Jefferson or something like that. Ed tells Jerry that a bunch of people in the neighborhood have been disappearing without a trace. But Charlie again doesn't see it as a big deal since Las Vegas is a tourist city and people don't usually stay. Ed says that Jerry's windows are blacked out, but Jerry sleeps during the day just like any other person working night shifts. I'm not a morning person either. I have blackout curtains and nobody thinks I'm a vampire. The movie then turns meta and tells us that the movie is nothing like Twilight. You read way too much Twilight. That's fiction, okay? This is real. He's a real monster and he's not brooding or lovesick or noble. He's the fucking shark from Jaws. He kills, he feeds, and he doesn't stop until everybody around him is dead. And I seriously am so angry you think I read Twilight. Yeah, we're not like other vampire movies. Our vampire is totally not emo. He's mean and kills everybody around him. Our vampire movie is cool. 
This just sounds like something I would have written at the time. Ed tries to convince him and tell him that he has evidence at his house, but Charlie thinks he's making it up. Ed mocks Charlie for wanting to fit in with the popular kids that they used to make fun of in school, and Ed insults Amy. Charlie gets mad and tells Ed that his life got better after he broke off their friendship. Ed leaves to go home crying on the way there. If Charlie would rather hang out with shallow douchebags, then he's not a good friend. There are a lot of people who'd want to be a better friend to you and not care what others think. Jerry ambushes Ed and corners him in a swimming pool. Jerry convinces Ed that he'd be better off as a vampire since everyone and even Charlie, who's supposed to be his best friend, mistreats him. And vampires are badass. Ed lets Jerry turn him and Charlie sees that Ed didn't show up to school the next day. After school, Charlie goes to Ed's house and finds his laptop with video footage of objects that appear to be moving by themselves. Charlie goes home and Jerry warns Charlie that he knows that he's been snooping around and to mind his own business. Because there are a lot of bad people out there, Charlie. Everyone's gotta look after his own business. I know that he's threatening him and we're supposed to feel scared for Charlie, but come on, the dude is cut. Charlie sees that Jerry brought their neighbor Doris over to his house for a drink, and Charlie hears her screaming later that night. He calls the cops and Jerry tells the cops that he was banging her and she screamed because he was just that good. Since he's such a chad, the cops don't investigate any further or ask for Doris' side of the story and they just leave. Cops are always useless in these movies. Charlie waits for Jerry to leave the house and Charlie breaks in to find Doris. Charlie finds Doris inside a secret room behind a closet. He tries to get her out but Jerry comes back and Charlie looks on in horror that Jerry really is a vampire. Charlie waits for Jerry to go downstairs and he helps Doris escape the house but then... <laughs> Oh my god. Jerry knew that Charlie was hiding in the house the whole time and just let Doris go outside to her death anyway? That's the complete lack of morality I've always wanted. Yeah, baby! That's what I've been waiting for! That's what it's all about! Woo! I know the scene is fucked up and it's unfortunate we don't know much about Doris besides being a go-go dancer and a piece of ass. But honestly, that was a pretty good twist. It makes sense for the story and you didn't see it coming. Jerry just doesn't give a fuck. It's great. Charlie is understandably in shock over the whole ordeal and decides to go to Peter Vincent, a famous musician and claimed vampire expert, for help. He's not really what Charlie was expecting. Never can breathe, you know. Fucking rush is a fucking kidding me. <clears throat> David Tennant to Jim. He just gives me Logan Roy energy. You think I'm hanging out with Dracula and the Easter Bunny? Fuck off. Fuck off. Peter obviously doesn't believe him and kicks him out, so Charlie's on his own. The movie makes another reference to a popular vampire IP. The whole house looks like that show. Dark Shadows. Jerry tries to get an invitation into the house, but Charlie's mom somehow believes Charlie, and Jerry blows up the house to draw them out. They'll need an invitation if there's no house. Oh, oh darn, that's awesome! That's really awesome! Wow, that is the most contained gas explosion I've ever seen. No collateral damage to Jerry's house or the neighbor's houses, and Jerry's not catching on fire despite being within a few feet of a burning building. Jerry is one world-class arsonist. A chase scene ensues. Are you doing a one-shot chase scene? Children of men, you are not. Jerry corners them in the desert and Jerry kills a bystander, revealing his true form. Fun fact, this is Chris Sarandon, the actor that played Jerry in the original movie. Even though he just murdered an innocent bystander, he still turns on the charm. Hey. This frightens and arouses me! He's just so charming, you know, acting like he didn't just kill a guy right in front of them. That's what I want, my vampires. Complete disregard for human life. Charlie tries to defend himself with the cross, but it doesn't work since Charlie doesn't have faith. Charlie, not the cross, yes! Charlie! Not the cross, Charlie! Ah! Oh. Oh. Charlie clearly sucks at this, so Jerry gives him some helpful pointers. It's right here, Charlie. Easy measurement. Charlie's mom stabs Jerry in the chest with a real estate sign and we get some Century 21 product placement. She passes out and Charlie and Amy drive to take her to a hospital while leaving the clearly still alive Jerry to heal. Step one, 
Make sure the person is actually dead. While at the hospital, they talk to the cops and don't say that a guy blew up their house, chased them into a desert, totaled their car, threatened their lives, and killed a guy right in front of them. Because it's just another night in Vegas, you know? Peter Vincent has a change of heart after seeing the insignia Charlie found inside Jerry's house and calls them over to help them. We get another reference to a vampire IP. Don't expect me to join your little Scooby gang. Peter tells them what kind of vampire Jerry is, and the movie undermines its own lore. It's a species that originated in the Mediterranean. They nest in the earth, and they kill slowly. They keep their victims alive for days. Smackers. This line confirms to me that the cold open should have been cut out. Why would Jerry try to bite a woman out in public and then run away? The artifacts in his house show that he's very old. He's shown in the movie that he's able to manipulate people and the police very easily. He's also able to kill people quickly if he needs to and leave no witnesses. I don't think that he'd be so careless as to try and bite a random woman out in public. That just seems like something a newly turned vampire would do. Not a vampire that's shown in the movie to sneak around undetected, has a bunch of disguises in his closet, and clearly looks like he's very experienced with kidnapping people and feeding on them for days. He's also shown to be able to eat human food like apples and beer, and feeds on human blood like it's a snack. The cold open is made even more pointless since Adam is shown to be missing in school during attendance, and Ed tells Charlie that he hasn't heard from him. The dog that ran out of the doggy door is never shown again either. What happened to the dog? Did someone find the dog and try to return them to their owner? The story also would have been better if we saw Jerry's true vampire form during the chase scene and not in the beginning. It ruins the buildup of the audience seeing Jerry's full vampire form since it was shown in the cold open. We're also told about Peter Vincent when Ed mentions him to Charlie, and Charlie looks at the website in Ed's computer, so the ad on the TV was also pointless. The cold open could have been cut out and nothing would have been lost. Anyway, Peter gets a call about a delivery and lets the person in. Charlie realizes it's a trap because you don't get deliveries late at night, and it turns out to be Ed in disguise. Ed calls Jerry, telling him he found them, and Peter tries to use one of the artifacts to kill Ed, but he remembers it's a melee weapon and not a long range, so he runs out into his panic room. Yeah! <laughs> to kill the boy! How'd you know he's a vampire? He's a vampire? Ah! Peter's house is a boss fight for Resident Evil, so Charlie and Amy have a bunch of vampire artifacts to defend themselves with. Jerry finds Amy and she shoots him, but they're silver bullets. Werewolves. <laughs> Okay, you splash him with holy water, that's good. Now grab something else and kill him with it while he's distracted. You're just gonna run away and let him heal? In a house full of every vampire's weakness at your disposal? Why do characters always run instead of finishing the job? You just don't get it, do you? You don't. It's no hassle. But, um... Charlie hesitantly kills Ed with a stake, and he and Amy run away without using the stake they just use on Ed, on Jerry. They find their way in a club and get separated in the crowd. Jerry finds Amy and turns her, and nobody but Charlie notices this. I guess whatever stuff they're on is mind-altering enough that nobody notices a guy crying out for his girlfriend. Charlie goes to Peter asking for help. How did you get in here? Well, security's a little lax since everybody got their throat torn out. Where are the cops? Somebody had to have noticed the security guards dying and convulsing on camera. Does management just not care that their security is all dead? Are they managed by death clock? Is it metal to have your trains clogged with dead rotting employees? Yeah, it is actually. Metal. Peter refuses to help because Jerry is too powerful and his parents were killed by a vampire when he was young. Charlie calls him a pussy, but Peter gives him a special steak that'll cure all of Jerry's victims. Then he goes out on his own to buy some supplies. Gonna kill a vampire. Good for you. I hope this one makes itself useful. Honestly, did the writers just play Resident Evil before writing the script? This can't be a coincidence. Charlie breaks all the windows in Jerry's house and goes to the secret room to find Amy. Peter changes his mind and they find Amy falling through a trap door into the basement. Jerry converted the basement into a den and uses Amy to trap Charlie. Peter tries to take out Jerry and Jerry mocks him. You got your mother's eyes. Your father's aim. Then Jerry hits him with a pebble. Really? A pebble? That's it?
You just saw that your head was bleeding. What did you think was going to happen? You're the vampire expert. You know that he's trying to build a vampire tribe and you're in his den. It was clearly a trap. Charlie fights off Amy and shoots through the basement to let in some sunlight to protect themselves. Jerry gloats, saying that they can just wait till sundown to kill them, and he taunts him with Amy. <laughs> well, she, she makes me feel young again. Ew. Shut up. Jerry then starts to make out with Amy in front of Charlie. That's rough. Zeus's pimples! <laughs> Charlie finally lights his fire suit and attaches himself to Jerry. Charlie somehow survives all of the blunt trauma in the struggle, and because the movie was set to casual mode, Jerry's chest burns enough to show where his heart is, and he stakes him. Though Jerry told him where the heart was in the desert. The stake works and all of Jerry's victims are turned back into humans. Jerry gloated that he was over 400 years old, and then he got killed by a teenager because he stole his girlfriend. Such a satisfying villain death. Put that up there with L from Death Note and Gus Fring from Breaking Bad. Charlie's mom recovers and Peter lets Amy and Charlie have the apartment for the night. The end. So Charlie turned his back on his best friend. His best friend turned into a vampire in order to get revenge. He kills his best friend, but his girlfriend was cured and survived. Sure. Why not? I guess McLovin was too expensive to keep in this movie. Fright Night was a pretty decent monster flick with a cool premise of dealing with a vampire in suburbia, but a bunch of storylines just didn't work for me. Charlie is the hero of the story, but doesn't seem to learn much or change. Everyone except Ed survives in the movie, and Charlie stopped being friends with him before the movie started anyway. The movie seems to want to market to women by casting an attractive actor to play Jerry, but then the female characters barely have any agency and the male gaze can be seen all over this movie. I can't say I'm surprised, but the movie said time and time again that they were trying to be different. Sure, Jerry is unsympathetic and calculated, but all of that characterization is useless if the protagonists kill him with just a lucky bum rush. Jerry's vampire reveal was also very rushed, and I feel that it would have benefited more with Charlie questioning Jerry more, and slowly finding out the truth on his own, and not Jerry threatening him which showed Charlie that he was on the right track. The cold open also ruined the suspense, but vampires were the selling point for this movie, so screw suspense I guess. I can't I can't believe Twilight did a better job when doing a vampire reveal. I enjoyed getting to see Colin Farrell and David Tennant's performances again. They really stole every scene they were in. The other characters did a great job portraying their respective roles as well, but Jerry and Peter Vincent were clearly the ones the writers were more interested in showing. The movie was trying to be different, but ended up becoming just as dated as its contemporaries. If I'm in the mood for a good laugh, I'll watch it again, at least to watch Colin and David Tennant's performances. Like most of the things in my teen life, this movie and my crush on Colin Farrell was just a phase. I've moved on to bigger and better things now. The thing was I would poke someone with implements. I was known as Vladislav the Poker. Poke me, Vlad. 